Good evening, everybody. Oh, my microphone's nice and loud. I was just saying how exciting it is to have an audience. Can we have a round of applause from the audience to show we're here? <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the second event for the Brilliant Connected Women in Digital Health Network. My name's Sophie Scott. I'll be your host this evening for this really important event. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and the land in which we meet. We're all around the country virtually, but here in Sydney, we'd like to recognise the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So this event follows a very successful event launch in October. And since then, the network has now more than 500 members, which is very exciting, given we've only been going a very short time. And it really shows that there's a big appetite to create a space for people in digital health to learn and share and connect and to inspire and to celebrate. And we were so excited for the launch event. We, we only had half an hour for that event and we really didn't have time to get through all the issues we wanted to talk about. So for this event, we've opened it up to the audience and we've been absolutely overwhelmed by the number of questions, which has been really exciting. So we might not get to every single question, but we'll, we'll give it a go. And then you'll also tonight be able to ask questions live of the panel. So we're going to be using a platform called Slido. If we can get the Slido app now uh, up on the screen and you'll see how to use Slido. So you can either do, which we're all getting very good at these days, scanning the QR code. You can scan the QR code that's up on the screen right now, or you can just go to slido.com and put in the code 39086. So that's the code if you're going to the website. Otherwise, you can just scan that QR code and join. And you can ask questions anytime during the, the panel discussion. We'll do the live questions in the last 15 minutes. And before we introduce the panel, I'll just go to the social media handles because we want you to get this really important conversation out to a broader audience. So these are the social media handles. So it's tel at Telstra Health and the hashtag is BCWNDH. And if you're on Twitter or Instagram, mine is at Sophie Scott and the number two. So if you include me, then I can repost some of the content later. So if you want to take some photos, if you want to tweet out any interesting comments that you might hear, that way we can get this discussion out to a really broad audience. So that would be amazing. So let's introduce our amazing panel. I'd like to welcome, we have Bettina McMahon. She's the incoming chair for the Australasian Institute for Digital Health. And before this role, she fulfilled positions including the COO and the interim CEO at the Digital Health Agency over the last 10 years. Give her a round of applause, given we have an audience. <laughs> Make the most of our audience. We have Martin Bowles joining us. He's the national CEO of Calvary Healthcare, and he's had a very extensive background, background in the public service, both federally in Queensland and in New South Wales. And he's also a, a member of Male Champions of Change, which is fantastic. So give Martin a round of applause. We have Florence Maua. She's the head of human resources here at Telstra Health. And she's responsible for diversity, well-being and inclusion at Telstra Health. And before that, she had a variety of specialist roles here at Telstra. So give Florence a big round of applause. And last but not least, we have Professor Dorota Gerti. She's the Medical Director for Population Health Services at Telstra Health, and that also includes the National Cancer Screening Register. She's a physician and a senior epidemiologist, and we've been, I've been speaking to a lot of epidemiologists this, this year, this COVID year, and, but Dorota's primary research focus is on the impact of the HPV vaccine and also improving participation in cancer screening. So please give her a round of applause. So just to kick things off, I'd like to ask each of the panellists the same question that we put to all the new members of the network, and that is, why are you passionate about digital health and why are you excited to be part of this network? So let's, let's start with Bettina first. So why, what, why are you passionate about digital health and what excites you about this network in particular? For me, digital health will be the game changer for improving the health system and getting better health outcomes for, for Australians and people around the world. So when we look at some of the chronic conditions that our clinicians and health systems are really struggling with, I think it's actually digital and data which is going to make that change. So I'm so passionate about being involved in that. 
And in terms of this network, I think we can best deliver that. We can get the best outcomes by having a really diverse group of people be a part of that, um, whether they're from different cultural backgrounds, different genders, which this network is championing, is, is so important to achieving our goals. Fantastic. Martin, what about you? What's, what, like, why are you so interested and passionate about digital health? And why do you think a network like this to, to foster women in digital health is so important? Well, firstly, uh, uh, I'm pretty much the same as Bettina, actually. It's, uh, it is the future of where we need to move the healthcare system. Uh, there's a lot of uh, data out there around healthcare. We don't use it well. Uh, it, we, we struggle in this country to link data, uh, largely because of the, some of the privacy issues. But uh, if we want to truly improve uh, the health outcomes for Australians, we have to actually break, uh, crack that nut at some stage and work out how uh, we get that done. Um, digital health more, more broadly uh, is really the future of how we start to uh, understand a patient uh, a, a resident, uh, you know, depending a client, depending on whether in aged uh, aged care, residential care, or community care, uh, it, it's about tracking that and understanding the individual at the centre of uh, of care. Um, as as for the network, um, we have to be able to connect people with what is happening out there. Mm. And any opportunity you get through groups like this, uh, I think we should just take hold of it and run with it. Excellent. OK. And what about you, Florence? I'm going to parrot um, what the other two speakers have just spoken about, really those health outcomes. And for me, it's at a very personal level, um, coming from a place where I know the impact that having um, really good health outcomes accessible to people um, and the impact that that makes on lives. So at a personal level, it's about each and every individual, and not only their access, but the data and what that can do when it's democratised. Mm. Um, and in terms of this network, it's, it's just a fantastic opportunity to be able to inspire, to be able to celebrate. I really believe in the power of the collective. Um, and for me, this is such a powerful thing and having such a wonderful opportunity as a group of women and you know allies to be able to support that, I think is fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful to hear from all the different members of the networkers. Oh, I'm sorry, Dorota. <laughs> I'm me. so keen to get onto our video. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, just a quick one because I have a slightly different perspective yeah, no, from the course. other panellists and, and that is um, as a public health physician by training, I'm really passionate about disease prevention and I've been involved in cancer screening now for over 15 years and I've been involved in, and seen what these large digital projects can actually do to improve disease prevention and especially in cancer screening. So in terms of improving participation participation, improving follow-up and improving outcomes and indeed we're about 15 years away the estimates say from actually eliminating cervical cancer in Australia so it's a huge achievement and we've got a long, a long way to go in other areas so that's really what makes me passionate and of course I share the, um, the um, sentiments of the rest of the panel around the, the, the network itself it's just such an important opportunity to, to share information and to encourage women to um, participate. Excellent. Sorry, sorry I That's all right. you there, but thank you for popping up. up your hand. If I do do that again, everyone just pop up their hands. So as I mentioned, it's been amazing to hear from all the other members of the network about what digital health means to them and why they wanted to join this network. Others have said it's about um, change management, it's about the digital transformation that we've seen in, uh, in the health sector. Others have joined because they wanted to join up with like-minded women who have a love for innovation, a vision for the future. And so there's a, a range of reasons that people have joined the network. So we've got a short video that we've assembled to hear from more members of the network and why they're passionate about digital health and why they wanted to join the network. So let's play the video now. I'm passionate about the way digital health can potentially positively impact on public health outcomes. And we've seen this during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also how it can help individuals take an active interest in their own health, helping healthcare professionals to diagnose treatments and conditions earlier. There are many reasons to be passionate about digital health, but for me, it's the way in which it can facilitate patient care and helps us support our healthcare organisations. 
and that's why I've joined the Brilliant Connected Women in Digital Health Network to meet other like-minded women and men who share the same passion. Digital health is an enabler to greater diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility to healthcare. Digital health provides data, which brings the opportunity to provide measure and meaning to what is health and well-being. I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of the Brilliant Connected Women in Digital Health to be able to have a platform to have these big conversations. I'm passionate about digital health as it provides data and analytics for health services around the country to better deliver initiatives and services to our most vulnerable communities. As a member of BCW, I see amazing people changing the future of digital health for the better and I'm so excited to see what the future brings. I joined the Brilliant Connected Women in Digital Health Network as I want to connect with both men and women who work in or have an interest in digital health. And I also want to help celebrate the achievements of women working in digital health. You can see that's just a selection of the many, many videos we received. And uh, there was a whole range of reasons why people wanted to be part of the network. Um, and it is the Brilliant Connected Women in Digital Health. So we're going to start with a couple of questions about gender equality. And the first one we want to talk about is um, what's something in your career that has surprised you about gender equality? So we might start with Bettina. The thing that's surprised me most is how gender issues have changed throughout my career. So as a, as a young woman working in the tech sector in the late 90s, it was pretty overt. The standard stuff of people uh, making comments about how I should be taking the minutes or um, uh, a more of a support person. So, so that's changed. I certainly don't hear any comments like that, possibly because times have changed or possibly because of the rooms I'm in now. So, um, so that's certainly cha definitely um, not an impact anymore for me. What is perplexing for me now, though, is the expectation that people have of the sort of leader that I am and the sort of decisions I should make and the sort of um, decisions they're comfortable with me making that I think if I was a man, nobody would question. Mm. So there's some tough decisions. Um, all, of, all of you out there in leadership positions will have to make, whether it's a mm. team leader running a small team or a project manager running a project or a CEO running an, running an organisation. Um, for me, decisions about changes in structure that lead to redundancies, shutting offices, which really disrupt people's lives, mm -hmm. which are the right thing for the organisation and absolutely part of my role. People are almost surprised and shocked and, and upset that I would be making those decisions. And, and, and I used to talk this through with mm -hmm. my board chair, Elizabeth Devney, um, and uh, this year we talked about that and I was trying to decode how much was a feature of my leadership I need to work on and how much of this is a gendered issue. And I think a lot of it's actually gendered, that, that people um, don't expect that. And, and, and she actually, I'm still working through this to see how, how, how much I need to change, how much I need to encourage others around me to change. Mm. And she lent me a book um, that Julia Gillard released this year and there was a quote in that that I read which was really stood out to me where Julia Gillard said, we shouldn't give women the burden of having to be the nicest person all the time. Mm. Yeah, that's a great quote. Really great quote. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll ask the same question to you, uh, Dorota, about what's something in your career that surprised you about gender equity issues? Mm. Well, for most of my career working in the health sector, I didn't really notice a big gender imbalance because uh, most of my colleagues were women um, on the front line. Um, but as I started working more in large digital projects mm. in multidisciplinary teams uh, in the technology sector, of course, there was a, very, a large gender mm. imbalance and, and only about 30% of um, the technical roles were filled by women. But what's been really rewarding, and I'm not sure I'd say surprising, um, is I think a mutual respect in those teams because the technical experts really want to deliver a product that is safe and effective. And so they do look to the, the health experts on the team, whether it's subject matter expert like myself or uh, clinical application specialists or even uh, testers who are subject matter experts. And similarly, I look to them as well to explain some of the more technical concepts that might be a bit beyond me, <laughs> um, and I'm not a technical expert. Um, so it's really about working together in a team, and, and, um, and it works really well when you've got a combination of skills and, uh, and a gender balance. Fantastic. And Martin, what about you? I, d I mentioned that you are a male champion of change, so, but what's, what's something that surprised you when it comes to gender equity and gender equality issues? In your career? Uh, yeah, look, I've, I've worked in a range of different industries. So in healthcare, 
Uh, the predominant workforce is, is female. And uh, what you do notice, though, is the higher you get up, the less numbers of women in those more senior ranks. Uh, and you do have to actively understand that and deal with the unconscious bias that is actually in some of those decisions. But uh, I suppose having worked in a number of other uh, industries and organisations, which I won't name because it you know, might be embarrassing for them, <laughs> that uh, have very, very low uh, female participation mm. in the workforce at all, uh, and uh, the, the, the way it is easy to dismiss views. Mm. And um, it sometimes will play out as, uh, as, oh, well, they're just not in the same field that we're in. But it's not. It's, it's, it's that unconscious in some cases, but some cases, quite frankly, conscious mm. bias, uh, because this industry is not one where you would expect to see someone like that. Yeah. And, and, and that, that still surprises me, because mm. that's still around today. Mm. Uh, less so in healthcare. Uh, healthcare is, uh, has probably... It's probably largely the makeup of the workforce, but... Um, you still see it, as I said, as you go through the tiers of organisations. And, and we've, we've got to get over all these things yep. and start to uh, uh, accept opinion uh, wherever, it, wherever it comes from. Yeah. And, and just picking, picking up on something uh, both Dorota and, and uh, Bettina said, um, uh, you should not, because you're uh, male, I shouldn't be expected to act in a particular way. Mm. So why should uh, anyone expect a woman to act in a particular way? We, and I like the Julia Gillard quote. Mm. I think it's a really, really good uh, way of actually thinking about these issues. Yeah, exactly. And, and Florence, what about you? From What's something that surprised you in your career in different parts that you've worked in about gender equality and gender equity issues? I think for me, um, coming from a HR perspective, we obviously spend a lot of time looking at diversity and looking at what this, particularly from a gender perspective, looks like. Um, and what has surprised me is how binary people can be about looking at the data around this. Um, so I've worked in, in quite a few um, professions which are predominantly male, and people tend to look at the headline number of what is the workforce participation. And it's, you know, headline, oh, we're almost there. It's, you know, 45% women. But they don't look at the nuances underneath that, right? So it's 45% women, but to Martin's point, how many of them are in leadership roles? How many are culturally and linguistically diverse women, right? How many of them are women who um, you, you've actually supported in? And, and what's your attrition and retention rates around that? So there's a whole lens around it that people don't tend to look at. Um, and it surprises me that we're still very much looking at those headline numbers and not actually unpeeling what those numbers actually mean. Okay. And one of the questions now, we're, these are all, from now on, all these are questions that we've had from the audience coming in already. So we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can. And this was a question from the audience. Uh, they were asking, some might argue, is gender equality really the issue? Isn't it about just finding the best people with their acquired skills and expertise, regardless of, the, of their gender? Um, so, Martin, I might start with you and then we'll, we'll go around and ask that because for some people that still is a, a, yeah. a, an argument that people do, do hold. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you want the best person for the job. I get that. Um, but what you have to understand, it, get, it goes back to that unconscious bias issue. Mm. And people will come to their situation, uh, to a situation based on their life experience. And if your life experience has been one that uh, has led you down a particular pathway, you'll do the same thing. So it's about how you understand that and understand that when you're trying to recruit to positions or you're promoting or what it, whatever you're doing in, in that particular space. So, um, and uh, again, it's, it is about the best person, but sometimes because of those biases, you don't get the best person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you actually get the bloke. Right. Uh, and, and that's not, it's not how it should work, but it, that's clearly how it does work in some cases, yes. And, and, and what's I, your view, Florence? Yeah, I was going to say, I would argue that it's, it's the best person, but it's the best person in a context, right? So it's the best person in terms of the team and in terms of the group. And there's a piece there around the diversity 
that you need to bring in. And so the best person is not just the best person in terms of who's scoring the highest when you're doing the assessment. It's actually looking at all these other factors and thinking about what brings the holistic best for the organization and brings that diversity into the conversation. Um, and so it's not necessarily even just about gender, it's just about that broader diversity that comes in when you start looking at all these other p nuances. And Bettina, is that something when you were in your CEO roles that you, you were mindful of as well? A absolutely, and often that argument, or it's not even an argument, it's a, it's a valid comment people mm -hmm. say, why do I have to hire the person who's not the best? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the problem with that question is that you're looking at an individual decision of one position and one selection panel, and, and Martin's right, you know, you, you will choose from the candidate pool the person who is best suited for the job. But mm -hmm. if, we if we really had all of our positions based on merit, then we'd have every parliament in the country. We would have every leadership team in every organisation reflecting the diversity of our community. Mm. We would have all different ages, all different mm -hmm. um, genders, and not just men and women. We have um, non-binary. We would have people from you know different cultural groups that the represent. So the fact that we don't therefore means there has to be bias getting there. Now, yeah. it might be pipeline bias. There's a whole bunch of reasons. It's not just people being racist or sexist. No, or overt, yeah. Yeah, but, but there is something going on that means we don't have the best people for the mm. jobs when we look at it at a macro level. So, so that was the way that I used to come at it to say, let's change that. It's going to take a long time, and it's not based on one person getting one job. Mm. Um, what are all of the things that we can do um, and I think we'll start to explore some of those because the way that we started treating it was less about specifically about women but more about how do you promote diversity mm. um, and women is a key part of that. But often the things that can promote diversity will actually encourage more women and more other people with different richness in their lives. Fantastic. Dorota? <clears throat> Look, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think to get a highly performing team, you need that diversity, of not just of opinions but also in terms of communication styles and views. Uh, and I think just as we're moving towards a gender balance or trying to in politics and on boards, um, in digital health, we also need to do that. Um, half of our patients are women and the majority of our healthcare providers are women too. So, mm -hmm. fully agree. And one of the important things about the network, even though it's brilliant connected women in digital health, it's very inclusive and we want men to be a really strong part of the network as well. And one of the questions that we've had from the audience was, as a man, this member was asking, I'd like to know how I can be more equitable. What skills or techniques can I add and how can I improve my influence in diversity decisions as a, as a, ma a man in a team? So, Martin, I might ask you to, to start uh, to answer that question and also just maybe reflect on why did you decide to become like a male champion of change and what advice would you have for other men who were wanting to be in that sort of position to promote mm. um, diversity and... Probably, probably the first first thing would be uh, uh, open your ears and open your eyes. Look, have, a, have a look out there, watch what's happening, listen to what's happening, and you'll have a better appreciation for the environment that you're in. Mm. So, so watching, uh, watching and hearing what's actually being uh, seen and done, I, I think, is a really critical part uh, of that. Um, and... Uh, I've been I've been around a few different places. Um, why why did I join uh, Male Champions of Change? Be because it matters. Mm. It matters, and I, I want to do my bit. Uh, and uh, that's just pretty much as simple as that. Um, I, I'm very passionate about things I get involved in, and uh, so it's it's one of those things. I had the opportunity to do it, so I did. Excellent. And so this, this question was particularly about what, what, are there any particular skills or techniques that, that this, this, this male um, audience member is asking about so they can, that they can improve um, the, the choices they're making to, to, uh, mm. in diversity? Uh, I, I think it's purely and simply watching and listening. Mm. I, I don't, you know, if, if a, anyone's skill set, if they're a leader in an organisation, should get them there. But they do have to open their ears and eyes to what is actually happening. Mm. So I, I would suggest most people have got the skill. They just have to understand how to use it in a particular yeah. set of circumstances. Uh, so if, you're, if you make it as a leader, whatever level of leadership in an organisation, you've got something going for you. Mm. So how do you then understand the environment you're in and actually use the skills you have to actually facilitate 
whatever needs to be facilitated. So did anyone else on the panel want to...? Yeah, I've, I've got one yeah. really practical thing and really happy to have someone disagree with me on this one. Something you can do tomorrow and, and anyone, everyone in this room and, and on, on the um, video conference, stop accepting 8am meetings. <laughs> Just stop doing that and then suddenly a whole lot of layers of complexity and difficulty for people in caring positions, which are disproportionately women, also men, um, also people caring for um, older parents, but, but often young children. Every time I used to see an 8am meeting drop into my inbox, um, I would decline it if I could, but if I really wanted to be at that meeting, if it was important that I was a part of that, I would suddenly be racing through, okay, is that a morning the kids are in before school care? If they are, do I drop them off at seven when it opens and try to get into the city before it starts? Is my husband available to drop them off? Do I get them dressed, do it from home, and yeah. then get them... So it, just it, be conscious of the logistics mm, that that logistics would add to it. someone's day yeah. by just and it's, having it, a meeting or an event at eight o'clock. So just by scheduling meetings in normal working Women's, hours yeah. will suddenly make it much easier for more people to participate and for more women to stop self-selecting out of promotions because they feel that they haven't got what it takes. Good point. Yeah. Joy, did you have anything to add or we wouldn't move um, on? To I'd probably, I totally agree with that as well, um, but I'd probably just add to that, be willing to share your expertise. Um, I think sometimes the, the technical language used can be a barrier for... Um, women in the healthcare sector maybe who don't have necessarily the, the technical uh, acumen. So be willing to share and explain concepts um, I think will make it more inclusive. So a question that we wanted to put to the panel um, that one of our audience members asked was about this year, about 2020. Uh, it certainly hasn't been the year that any of us were expecting and I'm, they're interested to find out how the panellists have maintained their focus and morale since the pandemic started. So maybe we'll start up this end, um, yeah. Lawrence. Um, so I come from a collectivist culture. You know, the, the village raises the child. Um, and so for me, um, keeping sane throughout this, and particularly coming from Melbourne, where we, we really went through that massive rough, rough patch, um, has very much been leaning on those networks. Um, and as part of my work culture, I try and also create that network within the people that I work with and so from a work perspective as well it's been very much um, encouraging the team encouraging each other to lean on each other um, I think there's a beauty in um, having people around you actually call you out on things particularly where you think you're traveling okay and maybe you're not mm. um, and so that for me has really helped as well in terms of um, getting to that point where sometimes I do need to check myself on where I'm, where I'm at and Martin, what about for you? Um, so you, with your job, you'd be you know, managing hospitals and aged care across Australia, and I mm. would imagine that that generally would involve quite a lot of travel and going to see the different um, organisations. But sort of, so from a personal point of view, how did you maintain focus and keep your sort of sense of well-being and morale with such a big change that everyone's gone through? Yeah, look, in healthcare, it was particularly, um, particularly difficult uh, with... Uh, uh, elective surgery changing and then all of the issues with aged care. Mm. Uh, look, it is about staying connected and, you know, one of the things we did very early was we created a touch base list, if you like. So we would uh, we would make sure we touch base with certain people. As an executive, we, we just basically divvied up some names, people who were under the pump. Uh, you know, in the first probably uh, eight weeks, I'd suggest, of... of COVID, most people were around the clock mm. because we we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, facilities... You should have had to prepare for the worst case scenarios yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. So we, we had to work out what to do. I mean, elective surgery was stopped, but uh, nurses and beds and doctors were all required to be available if there was the, out, you know, the really bad outbreak. But that's not a simple thing to do, and uh, you've got to you just got to manage the dynamic of that. Mm. Um, you've got to be able to pay for it as a <laughs> as a private sector business. So you you we had this, this particularly that eight weeks where mm. it was literally around the clock trying to deal with states and territories, trying to deal with our our hospitals, our aged care uh, facilities. But the touch base thing worked really well, mm. and uh, we we actually established a. Um, a pandemic uh, response uh, group, and we used to meet uh, 
I think it was about three times a day there at one stage. But we ultimately got into a bit of a battle, battle rhythm of, uh, it, it was, uh, uh, it did actually start off at three days, went to five when it got really bad. And then we come back to three, back to two. We're, now st we're still doing one, one of these a week. And what, uh, and I, I didn't run it. I deliberately stood back and I, I got uh, my person who looks after all of our clinical governance to, to, to right. run it because that way I could keep an eye on what was actually happening from a different mm. vantage point. And I think that's one thing about leadership for me. Sometimes you've got to lead from behind, not in front. Yeah. Uh, and you've got, to, you've got to be able to just watch the environment mm. that you're actually in. But that also, that's also a sign that you trust the people around you yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah abso assignment. absolutely. And, and if you don't, you probably yeah, you need do. to find someone else <laughs> <laughs> because that, that's, that's it largely. And what we were able to, what I was able to do actually, and, and what a few of us actually did through that process, you'd actually pick up when people were starting to get really quite, yeah. quite stretched and stressed. And, and when, when Melbourne went into lockdown mm. um, the second time, uh, you know, we, we've got quite a number of people in, mm. uh, in Melbourne and you could see the stress level starting to rise. Yeah. And through this meeting, we just created an environment where you could talk those issues through, what are we gonna do about X? And then if we noticed it, I'd ring them up or someone in, someone in the exec team would ring them up and just have a chat. And then that's all we did through the whole time and we're still doing it today. We, we just reach out and uh, about nothing. And it's quite, it's fascinating, you know, someone the CEO is also all of a sudden ringing up a uh, uh, director of clinical services in a hospital that's mm. you know long, long, long way away, and they said, well, "What do you want?" <laughs> just um, ring to say hi. Just, just saying hello. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing how you are, yeah. and, and it it really worked yeah. for us. And and uh, you know, we as I said, we still do it. Fantastic. And so I'll just go over to this side now. So the question was about 2020 and how did you, Bettina? maintain your focus and morale this year? In terms of the organisation, I was fortunate to be in a leadership role in the Australian Digital Health Agency, so, so working in the health sector. Um, so focus actually wasn't, it was actually easier this year than it's been in other years because there was a really clear and present danger. There was a, um, a, a problem that people could corral around. And so the focus was not difficult. Morale um, actually was also quite, easy to kind of keep our team motivated because um, they were so tied to mission. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't so much the issue for us, but it was, as, um, uh, as Florence and, and Martin have mentioned, it was more around the resilience and the energy. Mm -hmm. um, so it was being able to detect when people were, were struggling personally, mm -hmm. even though they might be focused and be um, really gung-ho. So it was um, through those sorts of things. And it was made more difficult not being face-to-face. -face. So I'd realised how much I relied on on the interpersonal non-verbal cues yes. when they were gone. And yeah. um, and also and those sort of micro moments with people, like you might just bump into them in the <clears throat> in the tea room getting a cup of tea and you just happen to have a conversation yeah. about something where you find out something really important. And if you're not seeing someone face to face, you're not gonna find that out. Or just hearing a deep sigh when they're yeah. getting a cup of tea. So um, so that was, that was mm. the biggest challenge for me. Yeah. And what about you, Dorota? So um, I've been Melbourne-based, uh, as have most of my team, and it has been a really challenging time, and I think we've all been busier than ever um, in the digital health space. And uh, I personally have had three young adults living at home, and I think it's been really hard for them, including a, my daughter who finished year 12. And a lot of my team members also had challenges with young children um, working from home, studying from home. So obviously, uh, from a professional point of view, checking in with them, and we had some terrific all-hand sessions and support from Florence and her team. Um, I think from a personal point of view, um, I also try to practice gratitude. I mean, I'm really thankful we live in Australia <laughs> and that we put the public health response first. Um, I'm really grateful I work for an organisation that's put working from home as a priority well before the pandemic. And, and I'm also really grateful that I had the NBN installed in January because I think it would be a very different story because we couldn't even get Netflix in January. Oh, no, no that's a cruel so, yeah, that's Exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, and obviously, you know, the self-care, but I think we also, also have to be not, not to be too hard on ourselves if we don't kind of do yoga and meditation every few every days day. or whatever we put on our to-do list. You know, we do have to take it easy. It's been a really difficult and challenging year. Yeah. Well, that actually leads really well into our 
our next question, which was um, about sort of health and aged care more broadly. And as leaders in, in healthcare and aged care, how can we halt and reverse, ideally, the volume of, of burnout and distress that's currently being experienced in, you know, by people working in hospitals and aged care and community settings? Um, so we might start up, up this end. So, so Mum, when you're looking at your staff, how do you... I mean, you mentioned sort of calling them, but um, if people don't have a system like that, how do, how do we more broadly just make sure that, mm. that, that that staff are not getting burnt out and are not, you know, turning up to work, you know, being unable to do their jobs just because of the sheer overwhelm of what they're doing? It, it's, it has been interesting because, uh, as I said, it, uh, at some points uh, the staff didn't have enough to do mm. because everything stopped. Mm. Uh, and then things come back and then all of a sudden they've got too much to do. So what, what we tried to do is, uh, is look at uh, uh, how could we supplement work, workforces in particular locations. We had to look at this particularly in aged care. So if there was a problem within one of our aged care facilities, what would we actually do? And could we swap in and swap out? Mm. Um, we did a lot of work with unions uh, around uh, understanding if people could move across hospital, uh, residential aged care, community care settings. They are quite different award structures. Mm. Um, and so we actually uh, were able to actually get a system where we could move people backwards and forwards and, and, and everyone was really comfortable well, with, with that. Yeah. So, so it's just about coming up with different mechanisms yeah. to uh, assist yeah. when there was a problem. Yeah. And Florence, what about from, from your point of view, and especially with HR, I guess, yes. um, what are the sort of things that you, you look at or that you think can help to stop, stop people being sort of burnt out and, yeah. and feeling overwhelmed with the, the, either the volume of the work that they've got, particularly, particularly those people in healthcare who are in the sort of more caring side yeah. of things, caring for people? Yeah, so I, I think the way we approached it was very much there, there was the organisational responsibility around what we as an organisation tell our people we expect from them mm. and being realistic about the challenges that the, our people were going through to Dorota's point you know you've got people who are, have children who are at home and they need yeah, to homeschool like yeah. you need to have some you need to reset your expectations mm. but then there's also the individual responsibility so from a corporate res corporate perspective we looked at we already had pretty good flexible working arrangements mm. but we revisited those we revisited the leave that people could take to look after their children we revisited and re-emphasized some of the pieces around our flexible working and the time that people could take and the time that people needed to work and, and so those and really practical things must exactly. make a huge difference to people but it's really just and some of it was stuff that was already there but it was really reinforcing that look it's okay for you to take it because was also that piece where individuals were saying but there's work and if I don't I do it to, my team yeah. exactly so as an organization giving the permission setting up the policies giving the permission to take them but then also saying as an individual what are some of the tools that we can provide you or that we can point you to that from an individual perspective when you're in your house you can see how you manage your time yeah. and so it was also about finding ways that we could point them to resources in that perspective as well. Sophie, I, I wonder if, if we step back from this year mm -hmm. and think about the question more broadly about burnout of, of workers in, in mm -hmm. the health sector, I'd like to test something with you, Dorota. So um, Walter Komet, who used to run um, a PHN out here in Western Sydney, said uh, something a few years ago to me that's really stuck, and he said um, that technology has a lot to answer for, um, <laughs> where there's a, a, an old process plus technology equals complex new process mm -hmm. um, and it was just where his point was without a proper rethink of what we're doing and applying technology in a way to that to modify and streamline things you end up just complexifying the ways that things have always been done mm -hmm. and that can then lead to more of a burden on the healthcare workers mm -hmm. to use tech and they end up hating tech because they think that's the problem rather than redesigning. In the work with the cervical cancer register and other sorts of things you've probably been at the front line of those challenges. Do you think that um, we actually redesign processes enough when we implement tech in, in health? 
Um, I think that's a really good point. Mm. Um, I, I think we need to take a more holistic view and look at end-to-end -end solutions. And, and it's not just about implementing a, a new application, as you say, because sometimes you can actually create more problems. You need to look at, look at the whole process, mm. um, look at the model of care or look at the model of prevention and see how it fits into that um, so that you don't end up with complex workarounds at different ends of the, the spectrum, which can create additional stress. And, uh, you know, I think... Um, you know, we heard about it in the media. There was examples of that um, with the contact tracing, um, mm. in um, particularly you know in Victoria, where we, you know urgent solutions had to be implemented to to stop exactly that sort of those workarounds, which created a lot of uh, additional stress and, and burnout. Um, so I think that's a really important point about looking at it end mm. to end mm. and looking at the how the business processes work around the, the software that we're implementing or the platform that we're implementing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think the other thing, you know, and it is always um, hard to recognise, but there is a point where someone's well-being um, is, is actually, and mental health is affected, mm. and so mm. making sure that they do seek professional counselling if needed, if mm. they're, you know, not sleeping, not eating, their interpersonal relationships are affected. So... Um, you know, we obviously have that duty of care to our staff and, and I think that can be really difficult in a very stressful, you know, emergency environment. But I think as, as healthcare professionals, we often put ourselves last and put our patients first and you know, we have to put the oxygen mask on ourselves sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. That leads into our next question, which is what practices do you personally use to avoid burnout and feeling overwhelmed? So maybe we'll start up this end. Is there, just, just briefly, yeah, what, are, brief, what, are well, some, what are your sort of not negotiable things that you do so that you can you know, function well and, and, and not feel overwhelmed and burnt out in, yeah. in the busy sort of environment that you have? So for me, uh, it's yoga. Um, and it was a bit difficult doing that virtually in lockdown. <laughs> and when we're in lo you know, second lockdown in Melbourne, it was really just getting some fresh air, going out mm. for a walk. Um, and, and small things, like I said before, it's important not to be too hard on ourselves that we, we, we're not doing the usual amount of exercise we might do or not eating the, the healthy diet that we normally might. And what about you, Bettina? Uh, there's a few things for me. I'll pick, pick just one. Um, so for me, um, being able to get out for a run a few times a week mm -hmm. um, is quite important. And I realised how important that was this year when I got a just enough of a respiratory infection and so I couldn't do that for four weeks. And it was, um, I think, in May when I was really busy too. Mm. And there was one point at the end of May, a couple of weeks after Mother's Day, where I just felt like I hit a wall. And, yeah. and I think, had I been able to run, I, I, it would have been okay. <laughs> there was, you know, a hundred things going on mm. that, that all contributed. But I think it's when... I, I think, for me, it's trying to be conscious about the things I need to do to de-stress. And, yeah. and if I can't do them, finding a way around it, which I didn't do this year. So yeah. <laughs> That's right. We're all only human. And what about you, Martin, just briefly? What are the things that are your sort of go-to things that you, you try to, to sort of keep your equilibrium? I don't have, have a lot of specific things, I suppose, but uh, because of the, some of the jobs I've done and they've been reasonably high pressure from time to time, mm. I've sort of learnt how to be present in the circumstances I need to be present, mm. whether that's in a home, home environment or work environment and things like that. Now, of course you do... Uh, bleed into one and the other from but, time but to being time. Being mindful of when you're but, like when yeah. you're at home with the family that that's the, that's that all your focus and attention. Yeah, and, and look, and even if you're at home and and there's a work issue going on, learn how to switch on and switch mm -hmm. off in the home environment because you just can't leave certain things, but then get straight back in and get your head into where you are. I like to say, be present. Mm. Be present for the people that are, uh, are with you. And uh, that makes a big difference, I think. Yeah. And I, I agree with that, Martin, and I, I do the same. So for me, it's exercise, but also I use the technology to force me um, mm -hmm. because I can be quite compulsive <laughs> once I'm on the laptop. Um, so I, I've put in various apps and, and things on my, my phone and my computer, which will stop, kick me off things for yes. certain use times. Technology sort of for good. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And, and that I find very helpful. Um, my team might say I'm not particularly good with some of, <laughs> some of it, but I do try. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've got lots of questions coming in, but before we just go to those, I just did want to ask one more quick question, and it was about, um, you know, during this year, obviously, we've seen a big uptake in, in digital health, which has been fantastic, but the question was, what strategies do we need to put in place to have a, and this might be one, we'll start with Bettina, what strategies do we need to be put in place to have an authentic long-term integration of digital into healthcare so that we can sort of build on the, the advances and the gains we've had this year, say, for example, like with telehealth, how do we 
embed those and also increase the, 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 the use and relevance of digital when it comes to healthcare? Well, one thing I'd offer, because I'm really interested in hearing everyone else's <laughs> views, um, would be not going for the really cool bleeding edge technology. So, so not the, th I don't know. The bright, shiny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just realising that we've actually come a long way in the last mm -hmm. nine months and, and just even, even telephone consultations are a really big deal mm -hmm. um, in healthcare. So, you know, it's, it's often sniggered at as how low tech it is, but I think understanding how important the concept of virtual care mm -hmm. is, even if it's just using a telephone, and, and, and trying to be the bed difference that down. between someone getting care and not getting care. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Did anyone else want to have a, a input into yeah. that? Look, I think it is about expanding on those building blocks and uh, interoperability between systems. I mean, one of the things I think we've seen in the pandemic is that thirst for real time, high quality mm -hmm. data that could be accessed across the healthcare system. And I think we're not really quite there yet mm -hmm. and so um, whilst as there, there are those sort of rapidly deployed tactical solutions, the bright shiny things, mm -hmm. it, it is there is still work to do to get the building blocks um, in place and to get those digital models of care in place. Mm -hmm. And what about, I'll just briefly go to this side and then we'll go to a few more questions. How do we grow, how do we, because we have made some amazing advance this year if you think about yeah. how far it's come. So if I, I just go back pre-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, I think we sometimes just introduce a bit of tech because it's cool to do it. It's mm. a bit that way and that's what we do. And then, it, then we're surprised it doesn't work yeah. because it doesn't fit your strategic view of how the, how the thing should work. So what, what we've spent a lot of time on through this year, because uh, you know, obviously tech was moving at a quite a, uh, an interesting pace there mm. for a while, um, but we did a lot of work about understanding our own maturity. Mm. And of course, what we found is we're not very mature. Um, so therefore, you actually then start to put together what, what is your strategic vision of digital and how is it going to enable things. And, and one of the most simple things that, that we did was we did an app to screen people in community care because mm. we never see these people now because yep. they don't come to an office anymore. They go straight to someone's home. Uh, a simple self-fill self out app like the, like the uh, QR, QR code, code thing, yeah. similar to that. That's what they do that. They do that themselves every single day and, and we can monitor it, manage it. We don't have to worry about how that actually happens. That was just, just a simple thing we, we could do. But it had to fit, though, within that broader framework and, and vision of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. And no, what I, do you I think, Florence? completely agree. And I think at, at the end of the day, um, Martin, to your point, that user experience mm. um, and with all the lovely shiny things that we tend to pursue. And it's such a broad field. It's actually thinking about what's the end outcome here? What are we mm. trying to achieve and bringing it back to that? Yep. So we've got a good question here about, um, and they're asking what personal innovation do each of you want to see in digital health? So Bettina, we'll start with you. So what, what, what is the sort of top of your list in terms of um, personal innovation that's something you're passionate about that you'd like to see? I would love to see some practical advice of what decisions I should be making about my health. Right. So knock yourself out with my data. Um, mm. Take a look at my patterns of, I don't know, what my exercise diet, where I go, where I live. Pull it together with your best intelligence and algorithms and just tell me. Do I need, yeah, yeah. Personalise it and make it mm. simple for me. Mm. What about you, Dorota? I'm thinking more from the, the program point of view, and particularly the cancer screening program. Um, I'd really like to see a greater uptake of uh, e-referrals, electronic referrals, because that would really improve um, um, follow-up and the safety net function of the register and also um, real-time coded clinical outcome data that's coded right. to health standards, no CT. That's been a real ba barrier in terms of evaluating and monitoring programs. Fantastic. Um, we'll go to this side. So what's from a sort of personal point of view, what's the one sort of personal innovation in digital health that you'd like to really see people take up or, or happen if it doesn't exist now? It, it's, it's about getting my data, the consumer's data, mm. into my hands when I need it. Mm. That's why I was always a great supporter of uh, my health record. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we've had some interesting uh, little journeys along that road. But at the end of the day, if you can create 
uh, a framework, if you can create the infrastructure, which largely all my health record is, mm. uh, that allows you then to build your personal information and be able to understand your personal information, I think that'd be great. Yeah. I think mine is a combination of Bettina and Martin's answer, which is really around the consolidation of that information, but from a user perspective as well, in a user-friendly way, mm. right? So I, I think clinicians sometimes forget <laughs> that users, um, well, <laughs> that they're, well, users, um, but clinicians sometimes forget that the language that they that they use is sometimes a barrier, and there's a reason that everyone goes on to Google to try and self-diagnose. <laughs> um, so it's it's that next level of actually dumbing it down, if you like. So one of the things, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, we're all getting very good now with QR codes and handing over our information, but there is still, when it comes to digital health, there is that, that level of trust about handing over information um, and it plays such an important role in the, in, the, in the adoption of digital technologies. And a question was, how can we further boost people's trust in digital health in Australia? So, Tina, what do you think we need to do to... To, to make people feel safe in handing over their, their data so that they can get, like you just described, you know, some recommendations from their uh, real personalised recommendations based on their own behaviours and diet and exercise, whatever they need to be doing. But to do that, you need to hand over all your data so that someone can give you that recommendation. Yeah. I th I th one thing I've learned is that trust is fluid. It ebbs and mm. flows. It's not a constant thing, and that's what makes it so hard uh, for, for everyone involved in digital health mm. uh, because you can't kind of set something and then build something for two years mm. based on that. So, and even um, the comment you made, Sophie, about checking mm. in and providing mm. your personal information, I'm really uncomfortable doing that a lot of the time now because here in Sydney, um, the, that clear and present danger um, sort mm. of isn't there. And um, I was uh, in a few meetings this week on, on Tuesday and had to check into half a dozen different places. And whenever the place had the, uh, the venue had the Service New South Wales app, I was so happy because I've mm. got confidence that they're not going to rip off my data for some commercial purpose. Whereas if I went to a cafe, which... You just don't know where that yeah, information is. I had the option, do you want to yeah. receive the newsletters? It's like, really? I'm no. checking in. <laughs> so, I just want a coffee. Yeah. So I think, to, to you know, thinking about the community, yes, um, you're absolutely right. The people mm. have been really trusting of institutions this year in handing over their data, but I think that is a temporary thing where there is a is a real need. And, and what we can learn in the health system more broadly about that is that um, we need to make sure that those controls can change over time mm. as people's um, preferences change and their needs um, change as well. Dorota? So I think we really need to better communicate and also demonstrate the improvements in, that mm. um, digital tools can provide in healthcare in terms of improving safety, improving quality and improving outcomes. Um, and uh, so it's a, not just about communicating, but it's about demonstrating mm. that. Mm. Uh, and I think often we don't do that very well. Um, maybe we don't always have the data that are necessary to do that. But I think that's a key element of building trust. Mm. So what's I, in it for you? Yeah, exactly. What's in it yeah, for you? What do I get out of it? And that's you probably know, um, why that people and why. You know, have been quite happy to to hand over their data, you know, mm. quite, you know, particularly when things were, you know, a bit more, um, you know, a dire situation, like we were in earlier in the year, people were much more willing to hand over their data without, you know, they're doing QR codes left, right and centre, yeah. because it was like we really, you know, we need to do, they were, everyone's emphasising contact tracing, so important, but now that, you could, particularly in Sydney, things are, are a bit calmer, you can just see the little bit of reticence sort of sl mm. slipping in, so things do ebb and flow. So the time is absolutely flown by. We have hardly got to any of our questions that the audience has asked, so I'm just trying to get through a few more. Um, one question which is about um, a technology question, which I think um, a few people asked this, so I wanted to just put it to the panel, and it was about um, the use of immersive technologies. Um, how do, does the panel see immersive technologies such as virtual reality or augmented reality, reality with 5G? How will that transform the professional learning and patient care in healthcare. So we might just quickly go around the panel and ask about that. Uh, so uh, at Telstra Health actually set up a virtual care business um, leveraging our telehealth business that's um, led by an industry expert, Melanie Gates, who's also a brilliantly connected woman. Fantastic. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, immersive virtual reality is a, a really exciting new area. I think it's probably early days still. Um, we haven't really seen a widespread adoption 
I think there's potential um, from the point of view of applications in, in research or in uh, clinicians walking in their patients' shoes, so to mm. speak, um, potentially also in reha rehabilitation applications. Um, but it's an area we're going to watch with great interest. Fantastic. Patina, do you see it's something that, that is going to be more and more important in the future? I, I don't know a lot about it, to be honest, um, but I did hear a podcast, um, the Peter Birch podcast, which featured a, an application of this in helping people overcome phobias. And I was really impressed mm. with how you could use virtual reality to there's help a, people become comfortable flying. Yeah, there's actually moment. some clinicians doing that in Australia. There's a guy in Melbourne who does a lot of that, actually. Yeah. yeah. He, he does a fear of flying um, virtual reality um, therapy for people. But you've got to, be, you've got to fly to Melbourne to do it, though. That's oh, the only <laughs> if you're not in Melbourne, you've got to fly to Melbourne, do the training, then fly back. Um, so we'll look for one question, which might be a good question, is how do, how do you all see the health landscape um, changing in the next 10 years and what can we do to help affect that change, to help be, be a part of that change? Lawrence, did you want to um, yeah, so sort of I, project I, I, forward a little bit, yeah. particularly, particularly for women, particularly for women in digital health? How is the landscape going to change yeah. and how can we all be a sort of proactive part of that change? I, I, I think this year for all of its issues has actually been extremely exciting in terms of the quantum leap that we've taken with a lot of things from a digital health perspective. Um, and so I think the momentum has started in terms of people starting to think outside the box. Um, earlier, Bettina and I were having the conversation that it's, it's quite fascinating that in one way we're leading edge, but at the other end we're actually quite archaic in some of the ways that we function. And I think that that's starting to change. Mm. And so I think in 10 years' time we actually will have have transitioned to a space where we are very much cutting edge, not just in terms of health, but across other industries as well. Um, from a gender perspective, I'd love to say that we get to a point where we have um, more gender equality, um, not only in terms of the types of roles that people are, are engaging in, but more broadly, um, just in terms of the experiences and leadership roles as well within the business. So I'm going to, this is the last question for the panellists, so we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to just jump to this one, and it's, what's the one thing that we can each do as individuals to raise the visibility and the voice of women in digital health? So we'll start with Bettina. And then we'll go around. So what's the one thing, what's an individual action that we can all take to raise the visibility and voice of, of women in digital health? Uh, Apart from joining the network, which <laughs> we hope you will do. One thing we can do is, is the point that Martin made earlier, there are a lot of women working in healthcare. So it's probably one of the reasons I've stayed in this sector so long compared to others. So it's just making sure that the awesome women we have working in healthcare mm working in healthcare, have a platform, so are just seen and aren't kind of hidden away. Fantastic. I'd like to see digital health organisations uh, create a better culture that's more inclusive and um, enable sharing of information and, and that respect. I think respect is a, is a really important word. Um, so improving culture would be my, my one. Fantastic. Martin, what about from your point of view? Yeah, mine's similar to Bettina's. It's 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 almost a sponsorship issue. It's mm. you uh, you have to actually make it visible and give them a platform, bring them along in whatever way you mm. can, and really just e expose everyone to what's actually happening out there. It's uh, it's a really important thing to do for people. I think. Yeah, I'm going to echo that. I think it's about championing. So I think if you're at the top mentor, um, create platforms, um, you know, if, if you've got peers that you can work with, do your part. Mm -hmm. If you can, if, if you have the experiences that you can share with others to have that conversation. Um, seek out people if you feel that you, you want to have those conversations, but start having the conversation. Mm -hmm. And exactly, wherever you are, and if you're, if you're a leader, then look to lead by example. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're lower down, then look to someone who can be a mentor and help, yeah. you know, yeah. help you up the up the ladder and um, and either way both can be extremely fulfilling both yeah. if you're at the top or or the mentor or the mentee yeah. everyone should have a mentor everyone should try and find someone who can they can talk to mm. at any time and uh, whether it's male or female that's what they should be doing mm. because you you need help you need someone to talk to occasionally and it's extremely rewarding being a mentor as well, yes, being on the other mm -hmm. side of the things. You actually learn so much by the process of being a mentor yourself that you're, I've, I've done quite a bit of mentoring for younger journalists at the ABC and you get, you get so much more out of it that often than I think that they get out of it. You learn a lot about yourself mm. and a lot about 
you know, interacting with people. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's very much a two-way street. So I think mentoring, mm. either being one or, or having one, is, is definitely worthwhile. Well, look, the, the time has just absolutely <laughs> flown by. So um, that's all we have time for tonight. Unfortunately, as you can see, we could talk for quite a long time on these different topics. And next year, there'll be more events um, focusing on different themes. If you have ideas for themes that you'd like to uh, put forward, please get in touch with the network. Um, there is, as I mentioned, a LinkedIn group. So we would love you to join the LinkedIn group because we'll be posting a lot of content there. And if you haven't already joined the network, please do. You can see on the slide that's up at the moment, that's the, the website, or you can just send an email and we would love you to, to join up. And like I said, the dedicated LinkedIn group will be posting a lot of good information about this. So thank you very much to our panellists. Give them a little round of applause and a virtual one wherever you are in Australia. It's been really valuable, amazing insights. We really appreciate you coming in and taking this time. And, um, it's, and thank you, everyone, out in the, the virtual world as well. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion and we we'll look forward to seeing you at our next event. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.